Hey guys, so I went to an AWS summit recently and it was really it was tons of fun. I re recommend it. It's completely free. They have tons of talks on cloud computing, what's big in cloud computing. But one of the things is uh, storage, right, which shouldn't be shocking. So AWS S3 is one of their big, big services. So today I thought I'd do a talk on AWS S3 and then how to use it and then how to monitor and keep track of what's going on. So it's really important to know what's in your storage. And really, you kind of hear some of these stories recently about... Um, people storing credentials in S3 and then, you know, shockingly getting hacked. So it's kind of important to know kind of what's going on in your S3 bucket. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So just keep watching and I'll show you how easy it is to get started. The first thing you want to do is log into your AWS account and I'm going to go ahead and create my S3 bucket. If you already have one, then you can skip this step and skip ahead to do just the checking on how to check if your data in your S3 bucket is being updated. So I'm going to go ahead and select under storage S3 and create a bucket. A bucket is great for storing a large amount of data relatively cheap. Um, so we're going to create a bucket name. The bucket name has to be globally unique. So no one else in the world can have the same name. And then I'm going to select a region. And the region should be close to you. If you're the one accessing the data, your company is accessing data, it should be close to whoever's accessing it. So if you have customers in Europe or Asia, you want to store it in those regions. And the last option here is if you want to duplicate it from another bucket. We don't. I don't want to do that in this example. S3 buckets actually have a lot of features for encryption and versioning control and tags. So a lot of information can actually set up a static website using an S3 bucket. By default, the security is set so only you have full access and it is not publicly accessible. So I'm going to create my bucket. And then I'm going to go ahead and upload a file into my bucket to test. The Nagios check I'm going to set up is going to be great for checking if the data is changing. So if you have a bucket that should constantly be getting um, new files, new data, replacing old data uh, from processing, and you want to make sure your data is getting updated in your bucket, then this is a good way of checking for that. So I'm going to go ahead and start off, just put up a simple file, a JSON file, it just has some random data in it. And this is just for when I run my Nagios check to see, it's going to check how old this file is. And it, depending on what my threshold is in my Nagios plugin, it's going to determine if the file has reached its max age or its min age. Now I'm going to create an account in AWS, and this account is what I'm going to use for my Nagios plugin to have authorization to check the S3 bucket, right? Because my bucket is not publicly accessible, but I want to be able to check the file content, so I need an account to do that. So I'm going to go over to AWS under IAM, Identity Access Management Service, I'm going to create a user. I'm going to associate that user with administrative access, so I'm giving the user full access. Technically, you could go ahead and really narrow down your access here to just S3 access. Um, but just to keep it simple for this demo, I'm going to call the group um, YT, so YouTube S3, uh, domain S3. So I'm just going to give it a little example. So here's the option for Amazon S3 full access. So that's probably a safer. You don't necessarily want to give more permission than the account needs in general. That's like a single rule of thumb, no matter what you're trying to do. I'm going to go ahead and create my user. When I create my user, there is an option to download um, access keys. So I need an access key and a secret access key. They should look similar to this. Um, don't share your access keys. As soon as I upload this video, these access keys are getting deleted. So it's just for security purposes. There's been some funny cases where these access keys got published in public buckets, for example, by major corporations. So you just keep track of your access keys. For security purposes, you don't want anyone accessing basically your company's data. Be sure you keep track of these access keys. They can't be re-downloaded once you download it the first time. But you can always go in and create new access keys and delete old ones. So if for whatever reason these access keys have any issues or you lose it, you can go in and create um, new access keys. Next, I'm going to log into my Nagios interface. And I have a few systems up. But what I want to do is add a brand new command and a brand new plugin to do this S3 check. 
So there are a lot of people out there who are using Nagios to develop these great plugins. And if you look in the credits in the comments, I'll put in where I got this plugin from. So it's a great way of adding additional functionalities. So once you click on admin and then click on manage plugins, I'm going to want to upload the plugin I just downloaded. And it's a script. It's a Python script. I'm going to click browse to my Python script, click on upload plugin, and it's going to upload it to my Nagio server to the lib execute directory under the Nagios installation. Once that is done, I'm going to click on configure core configuration manager. I'm going to create a new command. I'm going to go ahead and browse for the S3 plugin I just uploaded. And it's going to give me the help that um, like kind of the usage information for this plugin. So this is really useful for when I am creating the command line, the command that's going to run in Nagios and specify what arguments kind of run. So I'm going to call it, usually the command, I name it after the file uploaded. And then you see here, the command all starts with user one, that's just a path, the path to the Python file, and then the arguments it's using. And then argument one and two, I will define when I actually create the service. So then you could choose it multiple times with different buckets, the same plugin, but different bucket names and different time frames for the max and min times. I'm going to go ahead and reload the application, apply the configuration, and it's going to reload the configuration files for Nagios. So if there's any errors, it'll tell you. And then I'm going to click on Service Templates. Actually, I'm going to click on Services first. I'm going to add a new service that's going to use the command I just defined that's accessing the plugin that I just uploaded. So I'm going to click on New Service. I'm going to usually call it something similar to the plugin name and what it's checking, essentially. Then I'm going to give it um, a description name. So the configuration name probably shouldn't have any spaces or special characters in it. Um, you could probably put in underscores is fine. A lot of times um, you might see it with an IP address. So this is a sample of what it could be. So a little description name that can have spaces in it. And if you can see on here on the side, it has the command I'm using as well as the arguments to pass to the command I just created before creating the service. So for example, I'm giving it a bucket name and a time frame to check for. One of the best things I feel about using uh, Nagios is I can run this check, which I really like because it gives me an idea before I go through all this work that if it's going to give me the results I'm looking for back. So I run the check with the arguments, the bucket name and the time frame, and then I can modify the arguments for the different commands I might be configuring and run a check and see if it's critical or warning or in, you know, okay status without any issues. So I really like that about this. It also tells me if there's any issue running the plugin to begin with, like any system, maybe you have something, a library missing that's required for the plugin. It'll give me an error message and give me some information. And from there, I could try to troubleshoot what might be causing issues with the plugin. So again, just doing this uh, run check command is really useful for seeing what's going on with my plugin. Then I'm going to assign it to a host. I'm going to assign it to localhost. And this is just putting it under kind of what host it should be checked with. It isn't, the bucket isn't on localhost, but I'm just going to assign it so localhost has the service listed under it. Then I'm going to do how often should this be checked and what alarm should be checked. So I want to set an alarm off 24-7 and I want to check every few minutes and if it fails, check every one minute up to 10 times. I'm going to go ahead and save. So once it's saved and I apply configuration, so new configuration files have been modified in your Nagios installation and we're going to apply it to the running instance of our Nagio server. And now if we go back to home. We actually can see after uh, a few minutes, be sure to be patient. Sometimes it takes up to a few minutes. We can see our new service running and you can see the status of it. So my new service is going to be listed and it's actually under um, critical condition due to how old the files are in my S3 bucket. So they're over 24 hours old. So if this was like a data stream that should be regularly updated, we know something's failing in um, the process where my latest data stream that should be stored in my S3 bucket is not happening. So something's failing there. I'm gonna go ahead and upload a new file and with a new date. So you see I have two old files, one news file. So I'm gonna check to see what my status update now. If I click on the service, I can force the check to check immediately. So that's nice. So I don't have to wait. I could see 
what's going to happen to my S3 status with one new file. Now it's still listed as critical, but if you look closely, it says uh, it's a number of two files that exceed the time out of three. So it does recognize that one file is updated, two are old, but that still leaves it in a critical condition. So we want to go ahead and delete, I'm going to delete the two old ones, files, and I'm going to go back and run my check again. Now there's only a single brand new file, just a few minutes old. I'm going to force the immediate check and it should come back with an OK status. There we go, so everything's OK. Now again, this is great for anything that you need to modify files that are constantly should be changing. So it should be, you could also do the opposite with this plugin where it checks if, if it's too new. So if there's a file that should remain there for a given amount of time, then you might want to check if it's a too new of a file and it goes the other way. So either way, they're great options with this plugin. Definitely check it out. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys next time. I hope you guys are monitoring your S3 buckets and whatever you do, please do not store your credentials in a publicly accessible S3 bucket. Okay, bye you guys. That's my public service announcement for the day.